Hi there! Well, in last week's video we pressed our red wine which had gone through its primary fermentation and now it's ready for its secondary fermentation which is the malolactic fermentation which we're going to use this Lalvin VP41 uh, bacteria. Now you need vanishingly small amounts of this. This is a 25 gram packet and it's good enough to do 25 hectolitres or 660 gallons. I mean that's a lot of wine. We haven't got anywhere near that amount. And if you see anybody else using this type of bacteria online then you see that they use tiny tiny amounts. We're going to measure it out and I'll go through exactly how much we need to do that. But first of all we're going to have a look at how much sediment we've got left after uh, putting it into these carboys or demijohns. Um, if we've got a lot then we might want to just rack it off or put it into a fresh sterilized container um, because some people say that well some people say you don't need to rack it at all and you should just add your malolactic bacteria straight away after the primary fermentation and other people say well you should rack it off because if you leave it on its sediment for too long then that can impart a, a bit of a flavor so let's have a quick look to see how much yeast and sediment we've got now, I don't know if you can see, but right at the very bottom here, we've got a small layer of lighter sediment um, sitting below all the red wine there. And it's not that much compared to what other people get. So when we pressed the wine the other day, then that would have got rid of a lot of the, um, the yeast and sediment. Um, so it's not really come through into the carboys there. But what I'll do is I'll decant one of these and leave the other one as is. And we'll just see if there's any difference between the two. And that would be quite a good experiment to do, I think. Okay, so this is the new container without any sediment at all at the bottom, and I'm just going to add the malolactic bacteria at the uh, top. Now, I have hardly left any air at the top. That's intentional because, as I say, we haven't added any more sulfite at this stage, so we don't really want to introduce um, loads of air above it uh, to spoil it. So I'm just going to add a little bit of um, the bacteria now. So I wasn't kidding when I said that you don't need very much of this bacteria to do your malolactic uh, fermentation. Uh, it does actually say on here that you only need uh, 25 grams to do two and a half thousand liters. So by my reckoning, that's um, 0 0.01 of a gram per liter. So for my 20 liter container here, I only need uh, 0.2 of a gram. It's not very much. Fortunately, I've got some really sensitive scales. So I'm gonna measure out 0.2 of a gram and we can have a look exactly what that looks like. That's not far off, and that's what it looks like. That's 0.2 of a gram, and that's all we need to do 20 litres. So a quarter of that, not sure roughly what a quarter is, we only need that much for a five litre, you know, one of those sections for about a five litre carboy. Not a lot. Okay, so I've just decanted one of the jars and what we've got left is some sediment mixed in with uh, some red wine. It doesn't look particularly exciting, uh, but I thought I'd just sort of try this, um, not drink it, but just smell it. Because if you leave it on the sediment for too long, then you can get some sort of hydrogen sulfide smells coming through and that's really not what we want because it's a very distinctive sort of bad egg aroma and um, yeah, you definitely don't want that at this stage anyway. So. That smells really nice actually. It smells just like fresh red wine, which I suppose that's exactly what it is. Uh, but no hydrogen sulfide, so that's good. Um, I've added it now the malolactic bacteria to all the containers of wine, and uh, we're going to come back in a, a day or two just to see whether it started doing its thing, bubbling through the airlock, um, which will be a good sign that it's doing something. If it isn't, uh, and it's not sort of doing anything at all, it could just be that it's a little bit cold um, and we just need to warm it up a little bit. But we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Uh, let's keep our fingers crossed and hope that the secondary fermentation kicks in in, uh, in a few hours time. Well, whilst we're just waiting for that bacteria to wake up and do its stuff, I thought I'd just share you an update in the vineyard where we've got two varieties still to pick. That's the white Bacchus grapes and also the newer white Orion grapes. Now, it's really a game of two halves here, and I promised you that I would share with you warts and all in this vineyard, things that have gone right and as well as things that have gone wrong. And unfortunately, the Bacchus grapes have more or less failed because of the really wet weather we've had over the last four weeks 
weeks, I've not been able to spray them. We need uh, dry weather in the forecast to do any kind of spraying. Otherwise, the, um, the, the thing that we're spraying just falls off and onto the ground useless. And the Bacchus grapes are much more susceptible to mildew. And unfortunately, they have succumbed, uh, not all of them, probably lost about 80%, I would say, of the crop to mildew. The Orion grapes, on the other hand, have fared much better. They've got a higher resistance to mildew and so we will be able to take something off them. They're the same age as the Rondo grapes that we picked the other day so they're probably a little bit, um, you know, the yield's not going to be fantastic but at least we'll get something off them. So I'm going to show you the two varieties and you can make your own mind up as to whether uh, the Bacchus ones can be rescued at all. Oh dear, let's go and have a look. Now, the Bacchus isn't a total loss, but as you can see, most bunches have got some fairly pronounced mildew on them. Uh, you come across sort of sections where they're not too bad, but other sections, they're just simply not worth picking. So that's the Bacchus grapes and unfortunately that's replicated across the 11 rows that I've got uh, planted for Bacchus and they're the more established ones, they're about five years old now so I was really hoping we'd get a good crop off them this year and up until about four weeks ago it looked like it was going to be really promising but again that bad weather has completely wrecked us. Now the Orion grapes that I've got behind me are only about two years old but they are slightly more resistant to mildew along with the red Rondo grapes that we picked the other day. They're, that's because they're a blended variety unlike the Bacchus ones which are a pure Vina vinifera um, variety and they just seem to be a, a lot more susceptible to mildews. Here you can see, I don't know, I'll just spin you around. These are some really nice clean clusters without much mildew on at all and most of the vines are similar to these. So it's been a very frustrating year this year. Um, we were finding that uh, everything was going really well up until about the last four weeks or so. The Bacchus ones were looking fantastic. The Rondo were looking plentiful. The Orion were late bloomers, but they, uh, they've, come, they've come good in the end as well. Uh, but it's just these last four weeks that the Bacchus have really sort of gone downhill to the point that it might not really be worth picking much of them, to be honest. And um, then we had a slight um, bird issue with the Rondos. So it just leaves the Orions which might be our saving grace this year but we'll just have to see we're hoping that we might get a little bit of sun late on in the season just to ripen those up because it's now the middle of October and if we leave it much longer we do run the risk of actually having some frosts and things like that so we better get our skates on and see if we can pick those. Okay, just whilst I'm walking back to the house, I just wanted to share with you what something that one of my Patreon members shared with me. Um, thank you, Matthew, it's really appreciated. But it's a little information sheet, a PDF sheet, um, from Scott Labs, uh, dated 2024, so it's really recent, about fermentation and yeasts, and the different type of yeast that you should be choosing uh, for the different situations that you're encountering. So I'll share that in the description below, but I thought it was fascinating, to be honest, and it's something that perhaps I didn't really appreciate. And so so um, yeah, have a look at that and see what you think. But um, when choosing yeast to ferment your wine, it's worthwhile spending just a little bit of time choosing the right yeast for the job. So anyway, back to the house. Well, we're back in the house now and there's nothing too exciting about showing you a container full of red wine that's not really doing that much now. But I have got some takeaways that I just wanted to run through just as a bit of a summary. And here they are. Okay, so this is basically what I found out. Um, the malolactic fermentation tends to do better if the acidity is not too low, so not lower than 3.1, but I've got no way of actually testing the acidity just yet. I'm just assuming that my acidity isn't that low, so I'm just going to put a question mark in that box. Um, the next one is my temperature has to be between sort of 18, 20, not too hot, but not too cold. That malolactic bacteria is quite sensitive and it just stops if it um, goes below sort of 16 or 14 degrees, which it was outside in the barn. So I brought it inside just to raise that temperature. So I think I can put a tick next to that box. The next one is the free sulfites which uh, they say shouldn't be any more than about 10 parts per million that's why we've not added anything at this stage and I'm pretty confident given the amount of sulfite that I had to start with this figure is going to be more or less okay so I'm going to tentatively put a tick into that box as well 
The next one is that I found that malolactic fermentation does occur naturally. And if you just leave it, it will do its thing on its own. And I think uh, commercial wine growers that put their wine into oak casks will just find that malolactic fermentation happens naturally over time. So I can probably just put a tick in that box anyway. The next thing is how long does this process take? And it can take anywhere between two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, I'm not quite sure really, but um, I'm gonna put four to six weeks. I'm gonna come back to it and see, maybe I'll test it in the meantime, but um, anyway, it does take a little bit of time, so I'll just put a tick in that box. But more importantly, the last one is anything else that you guys uh, can come up with, then put them in the comments. As I say, I'm absolutely no expert in this at all. So people seeing this will probably have a lot more experience than I have. So if you see anything that I'm doing wrong or want to impart some tips, then put them in the comments and I'll be really, really grateful. So a big thank you to my patrons who really help this channel out with just a few dollars per episode or per month and you get a lot more information and background videos and things like that. So maybe I'll see you over there. But if you've not already checked this video out, then it shows you how we've pressed the wine to start with to get to this stage. Anyway, I hope you have a good week and I'll catch you in the next episode. But until then, bye for now.